we're, we're gonna, we have four illustrious Chicago journalists here, um, and I'm gonna introduce them, uh, and then they're gonna discuss among themselves uh, for about an hour, and we'll open it up to conversations for half an hour after that. Um, to my immediate right is Laura Washington. She's a political analyst for ABC in Chicago, a columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times, and in these times contributing editor. Uh, she was a former deputy press secretary to Harold Washington, Chicago's first black mayor. Um, she was the editor and uh, a Chicago reporter and is uh, uh, sort of uh, one of the leading uh, spokespeople for uh, the Chicago progressive community. You see her, you see, she's, she's around town all the time. <laughs> Um, we have Carrie Lydersson, a Chicago journalist. She writes for the Chicago News Cooperative, a nonprofit that provides content for the Chicago edition of the New York Times. She's formerly a writer for the Washington Post Chicago Bureau. Uh, she's a contributing editor to In These Times, uh, working in these times, our labor blog, which you can read on www.inthesetimes.com. And she's the author of Revolt on Goose Island, Chicago Factory Takeover, and what it says about the economic crisis. Um, we have Salim Muakil. Uh, Salim has uh, been in, in these times senior editor since 1983, where he writes the Third Coast column. He's a media fellow at the Soros Open Society uh, Institute. Uh, he hosts a weekly radio show on WVON in Chicago, and he began his journalism career in 1972 at the National Bureau, Bureau at the Newark Bureau of the Associated Press. Uh, Achia Beckus is uh, a novelist, poet, and writer. She is the author of the critically acclaimed novel Ruins. Uh, she blogs for WBEC's Vocalo. She, transla she translated uh, Juno Diaz, uh, The Brief and Wondrous Life of Oscar Wo into, is it Wo or Wow? Wow. wow. In, uh, from uh, English to Spanish, and she's a former Tribune reporter on a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative team. Uh, so I, I want to start out uh, turning this over to Laura. And uh, on the current, uh, on the In These Times website, she has a viewpoint where she talks about media deserts and uh, how important it is that we understand the cities, the sort of our, the media environments in our cities and how uh, this is. Uh, sort of a crucial issue. Uh, she's been working with an initiative called Community News Matters, which uh, in these times has received uh, a grant for Selene to be working on this and for Carrie, uh, not through in these times, but for herself, she's gonna be working on this initiative. And Laura was one of the people who got this started. And so I'm gonna pass this to her. Uh, she'll say something, the others will respond, and we'll go back and forth. Thank you, Joel, and thanks for having me, and thanks to all of you for giving Chicago a shout out by being here today. Uh, I think the point that Joel made earlier is absolutely important to remember that, and not just because of Barack Obama, but because of the vibrancy and the, the global reach and the diversity and um, the, I think, economic health, even in these times, economic health of Chicago, uh, the city that Chicago offers, it is a really important uh, place to study and, and, and and, and educate and, and, and I think and I see it as a two-way education in terms of what we may offer in terms of our insights and what you know about what's going on in the rest of the city, in the rest of the country. And uh, yes, Joel, uh, so thanks for being here. Joel mentioned the Community News Matters Project, which I didn't have much to do with start getting going, but I was pleased to be, uh, to serve on an advisory committee that uh, judged the uh, many, many very important um, proposals we got to do community-based news uh, pro producing projects on the south and west side of Chicago that was funded by the Knight Foundation, the Chicago Community Trust, the Woods Fund of Chicago, MacArthur, uh, Driehouse Foundation, I think I covered them all. Want to give the money people their credit. It was funded to, to do hard-hitting, community-oriented journalism in Chicago. And the pro project, the, the grants were just, just so Salim and Kari got them, among others, were just announced last week. Um, but it came out of a, a series of focus groups and surveys that were done where they actually asked people of color in particular, and low-income folks on the south and west sides of Chicago, 
how they get the news, where they get the news, and whether the news is adequate. And I think it was revolutionary in and of itself that question was asked because, it's, of course, people on the margins are often left out of the conversations. And they found um, one, of the, one of the quotes that came out of the research, which Joel just mentioned, is that many folks feel that we live in a communications desert. That even though we're in, a, in the midst of an explosive media world with the, the World Wide Web, the Internet, we're, we supposedly have more media options than we've ever had in the history of the country, if not the world, yet um, folks in these communities feel that they are left out, that their stories aren't being told, that they don't have access to the, the in, in information that's important to them. Basic information about the crime that's going on in their communities, basic information about test scores and dropout rates in the schools down the street, basic information about uh, job opportunities. Basic, we're not talking, you know, huge stories about world politics or the economy, we're talking about the kind of information that everybody in this room relies on and needs. Um, and I just want to read one quote I thought that was very telling about where we've come in our media, despite, despite the fact that we are so much more sophisticated and, and we have so many more options. Um, one uh, South Side community organizer, well, actually was a West Side community organizer, was sort of wistful for what she called the good old days of the news business. She says, I remember even 25 years ago, you would see the newspaper stands and you would see all kinds of folks, even the folks with the bottle in the back pocket, the guy on the street going and getting a newspaper. You see them going through the newspaper and they hang on to that newspaper sometimes for days. Now, she says, you know, who wants to pick up a newspaper? All you're going to see is another child got shot 22 times or the kids are dropping out of school. Again, no relevance for, for, for the news that matters to them. Um, this Community News Matters Project aims in, a, in its own modest way to change that uh, by funding not only traditional news models, um, community papers, uh, mainstream news papers, but publications like In These Times, uh, to do, and also community organizations, advocacy groups, shockingly enough, we're, they're going to fund advocacy groups to do journalism. There was a time when you putting advocacy and journalism together was considered a dirty word. You couldn't be an activist and a journalist at the same time. But I think this project seeks to defy that notion and to reach into communities from the, on the grassroots level. So I, I think it's very exciting. I think it's a good model for what, what could be replicated. And, and, and are, there are, I don't mean to say that this is not, these not kinds of things aren't going in other parts of, this, of the country, but I think often they are aimed, they in many ways replicate the legal, legacy media, the, the the, the, the uh, nonprofit uh, models, the, the nonprofits, the LLCs, uh, the, the Huffington Post, they simply, in many ways, remake the legacy media, and you, and you see that the, the decision makers are often the, the white male, at least most often, at the top, and the journalism that they kind of do is very much too often top down. And I think that what we should be thinking about and supporting more are the bottom up grassroots efforts like the one that I just described. You want, you want other people to comment? And you're actually you're doing it. You're, you're working for a really important media right now. Oh, thanks. That's very nice. Yeah. Um, well, one one thing that uh, that I've been thinking a lot in the, about along these lines in the past year, I work with a youth program that started um, working with youth in public housing, and public housing has been pretty much dismantled in Chicago. So. In more recent times, um, basically, we've been working with youth in different, um, you know, low-income neighborhoods, mostly black and Latino youth. And for the past year and a half, I've been working really closely with a group of kids in Inglewood, which is um, one of the Chicago neighborhoods that's sort of infamous for crime, and I think it has the highest murder rate and tons of foreclosures, you know, just a lot of issues there. And then I've also been um, doing a kind of in-depth story about Inglewood for a, a local magazine, so I've been talking with a lot of activists and with some young women who have started their own youth media organization. And the thing that I just hear over and over from the kids and, and also from the adults is, like Laura said, you know, just the absolute um, frustration and, and disgust with the media coverage that is just about the shootings and just reaffirms all the stereotypes that people already have about Inglewood and does nothing to actually Examine one thing that surprised me was they did seem to actually want more news coverage about the specific incidents of violence, you know, like why a certain shooting occurred, what the actual outcome was. I mean, you rarely see stories about, you know, the trial or anything. So that, that actually surprised me a little bit. So they did seem to want more meaningful coverage of the actual violence, but then, of course, of the um, 
positive stories and you know the regular daily stories about things that I mean life does obviously go on in these neighborhoods and you know I think people that don't live there really think it is just the sort of place where you, you step foot there and you get shot immediately um, and then also you know the I, I feel like all these uh, a lot of these alternative media outlets do do a really good job of you know examining subprime lending and um, uh, you know all the, the different systematic factors that do marginalize these neighborhoods but even I mean with this sort of media overload, I feel like the people, even though the, those wonderful stories are out there, maybe even more than ever now, they're still just not, since there is so much um, media, they're not uh, you know, reaching a critical mass of, of viewers or readers or listeners. And, um, and then you know, with social media and the blogosphere, um, that, that obviously opens up so much potential for community and citizen journalism and journalism by advocacy groups, which I think is, Fantastic because I mean any journalist knows that a lot of times your best stories, you know Two-thirds of the legwork was done by an advocacy group anyway, and they fed you the information um, But another thing I found disturbing about the blogosphere in terms of coverage of violence and you know quote-unquote bad neighborhoods Is that there definitely seems to be a whole genre of really poisonous um, Blogs, you know, especially like say in gentrifying neighborhoods where there's really a, a pitting of you know the haves and have-nots against each other where people use blogs to um, just um, you know slander their neighbors and write really outrageous you know sensational posts about crimes that do occur and, and just write blatant lies and you know since there is this kind of there's not obviously the same um, standards of accountability for blogs as there are for media people get away with doing that and it gets um, circulated and you know just further um, furthers the stereotypes and the divisions and you know the um, the hatred in a lot of cases that's directed against these neighborhoods. So it's just, it's tricky to know. I, I think the new media offers a lot of great tools, but I think it also is presenting a lot of pitfalls in terms of um, um, just getting more nuanced and, you know, meaningful and, and um, uh, grassroots journalism out about these issues. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Um, yeah, this, this this issue of uh, the the media desert, the, the news desert, is a very good um, metaphor, I guess you can say. And, and um, one of the things that I found recently, I think, is is relevant is all of all of the the activity going on in Wisconsin, the the, the union fight, the fight against uh, that crazy governor. Um, I, I took that issue to to a group of uh, young brothers in Chicago. Not that young, actually. Many of them former inmates, part of a group called Vote, and I asked them their position on on this and how did they feel about unions as being the last impediment to corporate takeover of America and whatnot. That's the kind of rhetoric we hear these days, and it probably is true, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but this this young brother was very contemptuous of that view. He laughed in my face and said, "The unions, we have no." Uh, dog in this fight. The unions are not our friends. In fact, the unions are our enemies. Uh, and uh, he was quite explicit about this and, and, and very um, uh, passionate about his opposition to the unions. And this is an example of how a lot of the uh, assumptions of the progressive community are wrong about uh, what's going on in our inner cities. Uh, as far as he was concerned, these, these unions have prevented black people from uh, getting the kind of jobs that that make their communities viable. Many of these guys are, are ex-cons with no with no um, qualifications. Their their, uh, their uh, resume uh, doesn't really uh, qualify them for much other than the underground economy and construction work, the kind of work that doesn't require education or any kind of serious training. And uh, the construction unions have historically blocked their entry. And so they have a very, very antagonistic relationship to, to trade unions. And, and so when you mention trade unions around these guys, they don't feel at all that they're allies. Uh, and this is something that we, we need to know about, these kinds of divisions in, 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 a, in the community, these kinds of issues that, that, um, that place separations in, in, in the aspirations of, of uh, people on the left and those who the people on the left are apparently fighting for. Uh, and it's just one example of how a lot of the, the, the 
kind of travel log journalism, which is what I call it, when, when you get these folks from the suburbs who parachute in and, you know, on a particular crisis and they try to, they try to accumulate all of the information they need to make some sort of uh, assessment of what's going on, they actually don't know what's happening. They don't know the depths of, of how, really, the underground economy, <laughs> deep networks in many of these communities, Inglewood, uh, Douglas, uh, uh, the various areas of Chicago that are traditionally left out of, uh, of uh, the tour bus route when, when folks come in. And um, it's, it's important for us to, to understand a little bit more about you guys, and that's why I think this, this, this uh, journalism grant to do some in-depth study and some in-depth uh, analysis of, uh, of what's going on in the inner city is extremely important. Uh, because we really uh, have a, a very, a very um, uh, decontextualized understanding. We don't understand the context of the choices that a lot of these uh, folks are making. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, the, the news focuses on the violence and um, the the, you know, the interpersonal uh, conflicts that happen so so frequently in these communities without really going beneath that and, and, and providing, providing some frame that uh, those who, who are consuming the news can, can get to, to form some sort of sense of empathy for, for the, for the uh, residents of these communities. One example is um, we had um, one, a rock rib, rib Republican governor, George Ryan, who, who throughout his life had been pro-death penalty. He had spoken and advocated for the death penalty for many, many years. And there was a series of articles in the Chicago Tribune by uh, Posley, Michael Posley and, and um, uh, well, Maurice Posley and, I can't, I can't think of it. But, but it, it, yeah, it were two Steve of them. Mills. Steve Mills, right, Stephen Mills, right. The, these two reporters did an excellent job of revealing just how many uh, men on death row were there for, for, uh, for convictions that were not, that were not, uh, 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 <laughs> Er erroneous convictions, right? Uh, and and uh, Mills and, and Posley provided the kind of information that that uh, changed the governor's mind. Uh, it was it was information about the context of uh, a lot of these convictions, about the the uh, the torturous um, interrogation process that a lot of these guys went through. I don't know if any of you have. Uh, heard of the infamous story of John Burge, this police commander in Chicago who was torturing men for, for decades, actually, and black men, uh, black. And uh, he, he, his, his activities were, were, were influential in, in putting many of these men on death row, and so uh, once that information came out, uh, the, the, the polls, me and, and Mills investigations began. Uh, George, George Ryan, who previously had no empathy for these pr primarily black men on death row, um, developed empathy. He uh, imposed a moratorium on the death penalty. Now, the state of Illinois has completely abolished the death penalty. And it's really because of the, the um, aggressive reporting of these two guys in the Chicago Tribune, a rare, a rare occurrence in a, in a mainstream uh, newspaper that developed the kind of information that enabled a governor to understand more the nuances of, of, of the, the structure, uh, of how the structure of uh, criminal justice has, has been corrupted. And um, it, it caused a massive change in, in Illinois. And that kind of information, um, even in a racist, white supremacist society that we live in can influence people and, and develop the kind of empathetic relationship with, with, with residents that we, we don't find these days. And so I, I think uh, the, the uh, Community Trust Award is, is uh, something that is long overdue and may be very, very helpful in, in developing a, a, a more cooperative attitude between uh, those in the community who are advocating for, uh, uh, for the the down and out, and those who are uh, in, in, a, in better shape in Chicago. Um, I am not familiar with the, the details of this uh, particular study uh, that Laura's talking about, but one of the things that I want to talk about is um, Latinos in Chicago and 
how um, media plays uh, with them. Um, one of my very first journalistic experiences, and certainly my first journalistic experience in Chicago, was at a publication called Los Vecinos, which was a fold-out, uh, you know, an insert of the Chicago Sun-Times. The Sun-Times had uh, decided that uh, Latinos existed and that it was very important to reach them. And uh, so they hired a group of uh, three of us to uh, take on the task of reporting to the Latino community. This was in 1981, and things have not changed a lot uh, since then in the perceptions of the, how to reach the Latino community and what was important to do so. First and foremost, what was incredible was that we were hired. We were all very young, and we had virtually no real-world journalistic experience. Um, not a one of us, of the three of us, had been formally educated in Spanish. The presumption was that somehow, as Latinos, we intuited uh, correct Spanish. Um, in fact, uh, the last hire to our section, and it was after our section was launched, was the editor of the section. We would write the story and then we would call my father, a Spanish language professor, we would read him the story over the phone and he would correct it for us. Uh, to give you an idea of how this worked, this was all of course done surreptitiously. Uh, the Tribune had no idea what the hell, or the Sun-Times had no idea what the hell was going on. One of my very favorite moments at the Sun-Times was when an editor leaned over and looked at the screen where one of us was writing and saw the word Polakos, which means Polish. At the time, uh, Polish, uh, the very large Polish population of Chicago included a lot of people who were undocumented, and so there was some political uh, you know, affinity between uh, the Latino community, the undocumented community, and certain people in the Polish community, and sometimes when there were raids in factories, these two groups would get picked up equally, although they were not treated equally once uh, they were processed. Um, and the editor uh, leaned down and said, what is that word? And uh, we said, well, Polakos, you know, Polish people. And he said, it sounds too much like Polak, you can't use it. And we said, but you know, it's the actual correct word in the Spanish language section. <laughs> well, it could be offensive, he said. So he suggested we say people from Poland. So we had to write people from Poland. Uh, in order to not offend that one person who might read the Spanish language section, or more precisely perhaps skim it, run into this particular word and be offended. Um, when I say that the surprise was that we were hired, um, it's because the other applicants for the jobs whom we all knew were actually uh, seasoned veterans in the Spanish language media and in Latin American media, and should have been the people who were uh, taken on. The framework of um, Los Vecinos continues to be the framework of pretty much every, uh, shall we say, non-Latino controlled aspect of reaching Hispanics, which is this weird presumption that Latinos are only interested in local news. Um, we tried desperately to explain it otherwise, um, and, and I will talk to you a little bit now about what some of those, what, you know, why it's otherwise. Most Latinos in Chicago, like most Latinos in the U.S., actually get their media, their news, from English language sources. The reason for that is that most of us are either English dominant, English monolingual, or bilingual. Those of us who are engaged in local politics, for the most part, they are fallen to that group. Spanish language media is the home, in terms of readership, of either recent arrivals, whose interest, for obvious reasons, still lies in the home country, or people who are uh, older and are never going to fully uh, assimilate, perhaps never fully even become functional in English, um, and thus 
local news has a very different uh, meaning to them. And the home country is actually much more important. The local news that they are interested in is how it affects uh, the home country or how the home country it affects the local situation. The connection is always to uh, the, the home country. Right now, um, there is very little effort, I think, made to reach Latinos uh, in Chicago's main media. Uh, there is almost always a presumption that uh, we fall into interests uh, with uh, African Americans in terms of local news, and uh, that our main issue is immigration. Um, I always find this really interesting because in Chicago, the largest concentration of Latinos is first in the 22nd Ward, uh, which is a port of entry, it's Pilsen. Um, it's also the ward with the least number of voters. The reason for that, of course, is because immigration is an issue there big time. There are a lot of folks there who are undocumented. But the second largest concentration of, La of Latinos in the city of Chicago is the 14th Ward. It has a population of more than 80% Latino. The 14th Ward, is the ward committeeman and the aldermen there are Ed Burke. Er, is Ed Burke, He's both, he holds both positions. Um, Mr. Burke is, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Chicago Inside Baseball, one of the two sort of more Darth Vader-like characters from uh, Harold Washington's confrontation with the old white machine. And he is, for all intents and purposes, the very last sort of uh, standing general of the old white machine. Um, the reason that uh, he is able to survive in that ward and still control it very much is because, in fact, that population is not at all like we in the progressive media frequently imagine. It is, yes, working class, but it is actually politically quite conservative. And the idea of a strong man in charge of the ward and in charge of their political destiny is not particularly alien. In fact, it's comforting. Um, it, you know, we never, in, in, in media, we never, in Chicago media, we never deal with these different sort of aspects of the community. Uh, we don't consider, for example, that the folks in the 14th Ward are probably third, fourth generation Latinos. Uh, and that to publish a Spanish language paper there, as a lot of the Latino organizations do in that area, which baffles me, is somewhat uh, irrelevant. No one can read it except uh, the grandmothers and, you know, Tio Manuel, who just arrived. Um, so it's always a, an, an interesting uh, thing to me uh, to watch this. Latino media in Chicago uh, is also just a, a, a fascinating sort of landscape because it's a landscape of extremes. Um, if, uh, if you look at a lot of the cultural publications, they actually exist in English. Uh, there are occasionally some bilingual things like uh, Contratiempo. Um, but a lot of the news stuff does, in fact, uh, you know, uh, exist in Spanish. Most of that has to do with the fact that they are chains. They are parts of larger networks. The strongest Latino media in all of the city of Chicago is, of course, television. Uh, we have local uh, affiliates of both Telemundo and Univision. And as you probably know, Telemundo is right now the network with the greatest number of viewers, period. They beat everybody. They, in terms of non-cable, non-subscription television, Telemundo is beating the pants off of everyone. CBS, ABC, everybody. There is no one that even comes close. Um, our local Telemundo um, news staff is actually pretty darn good. Um, and they actually do a great deal of really solid reporting. None of it ever translates into mainstream, so-called mainstream English language media. Obviously, nobody gives a royal fuck. Um, and so that, that whatever happens in Telemundo at 10 o'clock remains in Telemundo at 10 o'clock. 
um, ditto with our Univision uh, station. Both stations do what actually needs to happen with Latino news, which is to cover local news and international news. In fact, I often go to Telemundo and to, uh, and, and to Univision to find out what's going on because nobody else is reporting it. If I hear a rumor, if I know it's, of something that's happening, where I turn to is television because there's an excellent chance that those guys actually have something. And if there is something that relates to the local community from an international point of view, it's going to be on Telemundo and Univision. During the Honduras coup, which nobody covered in Chicago except in these times, uh, the only people who were actually talking about what that meant uh, for the local community uh, was, in fact, on Telemundo. Um, Chicago also has a, a good number of radio stations, and WOJO uh, is, again, the highest rated station in the city uh, at this point. They are beating everybody except, I think, BON or, no, they're beating one, one of the black stations is number one now, but actually, that's what it is. Um, uh, but they're, again, a network station. so. Their local coverage is somewhat, uh, somewhat problematic. They don't give a lot of time to news. But one of the most interesting phenomena in Chicago, and in a weird way it's a kind of a model, is a radio station called WRTE. Has anybody heard of it, Radio Arte? Mm -hmm. yeah. They're amazing. They, are, they actually come out of the Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum, which is actually known as the National Mexican Museum. Um, they were a project of the museum for youth, and, so, and it continues to be a youth-run radio station. Um, their, you know, their signal used to be such that you had to basically sit outside the museum to hear them. Um, but as time has gone by, they've been expanding and expanding and expanding um, their uh, their signal strength, and they have pushed the they have pushed everybody else. And to, to, to be frank with you, a lot of what's happening at Telemundo and Univision is because people have graduated from WRTE and have gotten jobs uh, at the television stations, or news is broken at WRTE and forces everybody else to, you know, figure out what's going on and go chase the story. Because it's a youth-run station and the adults at the Mexican Museum actually keep their hands off it, it's got a real down-to-the-ground uh, you know, hands-on, I know what's happening, uh, you know, attitude. It's very edgy. It's been a, a real leader in a lot of the immigration stuff that's happened in Chicago. Um, one of the, the youth founders, actually two of the youth founders of the station actually recently came out as undocumented youth. Um, and, uh, you know, they, their coverage of immigration, their coverage of educational issues, their coverage of crime has actually sort of been you know, leading the way uh, in, in absolutely all of the community coverage that happens uh, in Chicago. Um, unfortunately, newspapers don't mean much in the, in the city. The, the, news, the Spanish language community newspapers right now, uh, for the most part, look more like shopping guides, like gross, grocery inserts. There's very little original coverage. Uh, the, occasionally, there'll be some wire coverage about home countries. Uh, if you look at the local coverage, a lot of it actually is plucked off of stuff off the headlines and from WRTE. Um, it, WRTE is not for profit, and because it is attached to an advocacy organization, it also has a very strong point of view. Um, but what I have found to be so interesting about the station is that it's it's utterly fearless in its coverage. It makes mistakes, but the the fact that they have that point of view gives them an urgency and a passion. Uh, for things that matter to people uh, in the community that um, I think might really be the way to go. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. Um, so, uh, Salim, you are, have a radio show on WVON, which is uh, a very well-known nationally uh, African-American radio station, and could you sort of tell us about what's going on with the uh, media within the black community and Laura, what's happened with uh, the Chicago Defender, if you could follow up on that. I mean, that's one of the most famous uh, black papers in the country. Chicago Defender used to be a daily, um, and now it's a weekly, uh, although it has been, it has increased its its uh, its uh, ad, ad uh, base, and, and 
I, I think the circulation has even gone up, although it's, it's a weekly circulation now. Uh, it, it, it looks better than it used to, and I think by focusing on on um, uh, on, a, on news as a, as a weekly, it, 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 its integrity is, it has been bolstered, um, and it covers news that that uh, that the mainstream media only glances at. Uh, however, there's been a lot of complaints about a defender that is too crime focused. Um, the, the, the latest murder um, is. Uh, always big news. They've been making some attempts to, to contextualize that a little bit more in, 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 recent, in recent years. WVON is the only black-owned uh, radio station in the city, and it's a talk station, so uh, it is uh, in, in an environment of these virulent right-wing stations, WLS and, and others in the area, uh, constantly broadcasting these 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 uh, toxic right wing views, and so VON is looked on by many as kind of a uh, you know uh, almost an oasis, <laughs> uh, at least at least some some sort of uh, uh, you know uh, opposing force, some sort of countervailing um, force to to, the, to these uh, right wing right wing radio stations. So it performs the duty as as kind of the, the, the lone a lone progressive station. There's another progressive station in Chicago that recently has become uh, more more prominent uh, in, in the remnants of Air America. But uh, but VON has held the banner uh, of the, the you know the progressive alternative to, to a lot of these right wing um, toxic radio stations. And and uh, in, in the recent mayoral election, VON took center stage because it became the the, the kind of um, the headquarters of, of this of this attempt in the black community to develop a, a black consensus candidate in the mayoral race. Uh, there was, uh, I'm sure you you uh, have heard of Rahm Emanuel's entry into Chicago after he left the, after he left the president's office. He came to Chicago and decided to run for mayor, and, and uh, there was some contention in the beginning, but he, he managed to, to quell all of that, and he, now he's the mayor. Um, but when he first announced it, it was right after Mayor Daley announced in a, in a surprise announcement that he wouldn't, he wouldn't run for re-election, so it caught the black community off guard. And the only, the only uh, paradigm that made sense to a lot of black politicians was this notion of consensus, black consensus candidate. The only way we can develop the, the political heft to oppose someone like Emmanuel, who, who came in with all kind of credibility and money, the only way we could do that uh, was to develop a consensus candidate, one candidate who would attract all of the resources that the black business community could, could, could uh, Develop for for our political purposes, and and make a credible run against um, Ron Emanuel. Well, it didn't turn out that way, and one of the reasons why it didn't turn out that way was because uh, uh, Carol Mosley Brown um, uh, be, her candidacy melted down in a way that is illustrative of, of what we're talking about here, in, in terms of the nuances of the black community. The, the black community. Um, it has been overly policed uh, in, in drug enforcement um, for many years, and there have been several studies that, that have come out to, uh, that have determined how uh, how police uh, selectively enforce drug laws and whatnot in Chicago. Carol Mosley Braun came out with a statement denouncing one of her opponents as being a, a crackhead. Uh, and uh, that statement that she made, uh, being on VON, was one place where we we uh, we we um, witnessed the the uh, explosion of of criticism that that came out of uh, Carol Mosley Brown's uh, 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 charge that this that one of her one of her opponents was was once a crackhead. Her opponent, the opponent that she charged, also happened to be a black woman, uh, the only other black woman in, in the race, and so there was a. a an, an amazing amount of, uh, uh, of criticism that came out uh, 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 about uh, Carol Mosley Braun's um, statement. And it was, it was ironic and, 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 and a bit uh, 
jarring for people with VON because a lot of a lot of the VON audience was very much in favor of Carol Mosley Bond and many of the, the, uh, the radio personalities were pushing her as well. After she made that statement though, it completely changed the complexion and it demonstrated just how, um, uh, uh, how, how we, we perceive what is going on in the black community uh, in, in a way that is, that is totally inaccurate. And it's not just uh, um, the, the mainstream. The, the, the views that are, that are reflected back into the community are, are, uh, are, uh, are views that, that condemn uh, the, the lifestyle of, of many of, of, uh, of uh, the residents of the community without any understanding of context. And so I think Carol Mosley Braun herself, who was running for me, amazingly had absorbed some of those views. And so for many, many weeks, the discussion on, on, on the radio was about class conflict in our community and how, and how that nuance, uh, as Aki was talking about, a lot of the Spanish, a lot of the, the Latino community's um, uh, issues are, are often obscured by a lack of understanding of, of the, you know, the, the nuances in the community. The same thing, the same thing in the black community. The, the, they're, uh, it's much more complicated um, and uh, it, it deserves a, a much more serious attempt to discover and, 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 and understand the, the uh, motivations of, of the people and, and again, the, the context of their choices. So VON does a, does a good job of doing that. Um, and even though it, it is the only radio station in, in the city that pays attention to these, to these nuances, it is uh, still uh, dismissed by, by the uh, mainstream as being um, uh, kind of a radical or, or a complaining station, a, a place where complaints tend to con uh, congregate. And, and, uh, and no, no, serious, uh, attempt, uh, no serious analysis of, the, of the, the city is taking place because it's all filtered through a racial, uh, a, a racial um, uh, kind of uh, uh, sensibility. Uh, and so, I think one of the one of the things that also happens is that uh, VON is is in fact a black station and is seen as an, an African American station, but the white stations are seen as mainstream stations. You know, the Latino station is the Latino station with Latino interests, and VON is the black station with black interests, and we are guilty of it as well. I try very hard to say the so-called mainstream media. But I know that occasionally I blow it and I just say mainstream media. And what I really mean is white. For some reason, it's very difficult to just say WGN Radio is the white station. WBBM is white. It is white. But for whatever reason, saying that it's white becomes extremely offensive to everyone. You know? It's like, seriously? It is white. <laughs> Who is not white on those stations? <laughs> um, but you can't seem to say that. And this fact that these uh, the stations have a particular point of view by virtue of the fact that it's a bunch of white people um, gets lost in the shuffle. I do think that in this particular mayoral race that nobody in the Latino or black media exactly you know, uh, won any awards. Uh, one of the problems, I think, was that for whatever reason, everyone seem to think that there was an actual shot at the mayorality uh, for a black or Latino candidate at some point in the race. And all of the media that I read, certainly that may not be the case across the board, but all of the black media that I read and heard and all of the Latino media that I heard and watched uh, during the election seem to uh, take a bit of a cheerleading role with our respective uh, candidates, which did no one a service. Uh, Carol Mosley Braun was a terrible candidate from the day she said she was going to run. We had two Latino candidates in the race, and one of them made Carol Mosley Braun look great. He was such a dick. Um, and the other one uh, was a very good man who had very little organization, but who, was, who also had some things to answer for, and no one in the communities uh, made him, uh, you know, you know, put any questions to them. They were really not tested in any way. 
Uh, and because Ron was perceived by the white media as an absolute given, uh, everybody got to pretend that we were completely post-race and that absolutely nobody uh, cared what, you know, that these people, uh, you know, this was like the first, uh, oh, look, you know, there's, there's the majority of the candidates are minority candidates in a city that is in fact majority minority, if you want to call it that. In fact, it's really, uh, you know, it, it has historically in the last 20, 30 years been a majority black city, though nobody talks about that, it just, you know, we are losing a, a black population, but nonetheless, um, and I mean, we, this race could have gone perhaps differently, but part of the reason it didn't was because I think the Latino and the black media were busy protecting their candidates to some extent, protecting their interests in these candidates. Um, to me, one of the most significant things that happened was the very night of the election, when it became very, very, very clear that Carol Mose LeBron uh, had lost the race, the polls closed at 7, and by 8.30, the Defender website had an editorial that essentially repudiated all of the coverage uh, that it had done during the campaign, saying, Carmel's and Brown was a terrible candidate, we never, you know, she never should have run, and part of the problem here is that there's been a catastrophic failure of black leadership. It was like, whoa, really, now, at 8.30? Thank you. That did me a lot of good. I'm glad you got it off your chest. Um, so, I mean, I think that's something that also needs to be sort of dealt with. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with, with, both, with much of the analysis that both Selena and Hachi have uh, offered here. But I think, in reality, there's, given where Chicago is right now, given the fact that there has, it had been a, has been a significant loss of black population, which is, I think, one of the most undercovered stories. While everybody was talking about the mayor's race, uh, the Census Bureau came out and reported that Chicago lost 200,000 uh, people in the last 10 years, and most of those were African Americans. Uh, that was one of the most undercover stories out there that you can hear anything about. Because of that, because of the lack of organization, because of all the consensus infighting, Celine uh, discussed consensus infighting and ended up with an extremely flawed candidate um, who, who could not have won that, that race under any circumstances. But despite all of these, these, these issues and the, and the lack of media coverage and the, sort of the media buy-in, is that Rahm Emanuel raised $18 million in the span of about six weeks. Rahm Emanuel spent a good, a significant amount of time outside Chicago going to places like Hollywood uh, to raise money from people like Steven Spielberg and, and, uh, and Steve Jobs and a whole array of other glittery Hollywood celebrities and wealthy folks that he knew from his, from his connections to the White House and he knew from his connections to his very successful Asian brother in Hollywood. Uh, Rahm Emanuel spent all of his time uh, not in community forums. Uh, there, was, there were dozens, about hundreds of community forums around the mayor's race throughout that period. I think he went to three or four, and those were all media-run, media-broadcast uh, forums that, that, he, that he had to go to in order to sort of appease the media's perspective. Um, he's, when he wasn't doing that, he was going to L stops and doing very controlled, very rigid, um, very restricted campaign events where media were not allowed to ask questions and where the only citizens that got to talk to were the ones that briefly shook his hand as they were gay and all the L stops. Because of all that, and because of, I think, because of the media buy there was no way that Ron Emanuel was going to lose his election. Plus, he also had a couple presidents behind him, President Bill Clinton and President Obama, who uh, overtly and covertly uh, endorsed him. Um, so that, that was not a race that people of color could win. But I think there's, there was also some lessons to be learned about um, his, uh, some of the class differences. The, the, um, I think a lot of folks who felt that they, their voices were not, not ever been heard in the city, those would be uh, lower income communities, so all stripes, kind of checked out on that election. I don't think that they were really ever engaged to begin with. Uh, the turnout on election day, for the first we had just last week had a, a, a runout, which was even more pathetic in terms of turnout. But the turnout on election day in February was around 42%. That's 42% of registered voters, which is a significant minority of vote, potential voters in the city. Turn ballot to vote, and this is an election which I think it's been 60 years since there since there had not been an incumbent mayor in city in office who was up for an election. And this is the first time we had a chance to replace a mayor, that being Mayor Virginia Daly, in 22 years. 
daily and been in office for 22 years. This was, should have been an historic opportunity, yet only 42% of the registered voters filed to show, show up. I think that, 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 and I think a lot of those folks that didn't show up were people, again, who were, people who were, who were, who were from the, probably the most marginalized communities, people who aren't getting uh, the media coverage that they deserve. If you look at the word turnouts, uh, the, the, the white uh, boards are by the old machine actually racked up 77 and 80 percent turnout. Um, and these were the wards uh, that ironically were voting for one of the Latino candidates. The one I mentioned was a Nick. Jerry Chico. The, 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 the wards that were for Jerry Chico, which were all the old white machine uh, uh, wards, actually had outrageous turnout. If you if you look at the actual breakdown, the turnout was incredible. The remnants of that machine, and they're just remnants, can still really, really produce. But if you look at the poor awards, regardless of, of color, uh, the turnouts were down, in some cases, to single digits. It was horrifying. There were black wards on the west side where you had to wonder, you know, you know, who these, you know, 17 people in a particular precinct showed up to vote because the numbers were down that low. But it wasn't just that they were, you know, it's really important to, to understand that it wasn't just that it was down. Laura's point is crucial, but it's actually down and measurably down in poor minority communities and not at all down in white communities. One thing with the um, media coverage of the election too, I think we're both the ethnic media and, and the mainstream media, which you know, has more resources, so you know it's more of a failing that, that I think they um, drop the ball on this is people, you know, like like politics is always covered. It was a lot of the horse race coverage in the Chicago election, and it was fascinating characters and a lot of drama. So you know that's not surprising, but there really was a lack of actually um, examining. I mean, this would have to be more, you know, probably in a commentary sense than a hard reporting sense, but taking a look at what the different candidates were likely to actually do and how that would affect different demographics and you know and then getting to the intersections of labor and race and class and I don't think any you know any um, the reader did and the Chicago reader did a, a fantastic story looking at how segregation um, still exists so much in Chicago and tying that to the mayoral election but um, in general there there was just a real lack of looking at how and even in the aldermanic um, races in these runoff elections just this past week, with just a couple exceptions. Um, in the Black and Latino wards, most of the candidates who won were the ones who are, you know, the police, they were backed by Ron Emanuel, and they're most likely going to just do it, what he says. Um, so I feel like there was, you know, in all the colorful personalities and scandals, there was a real lack of, um, uh, at least in, in, you know, outlets that reached a, a wide swath of the public of examining what these candidates would actually mean for, you know, people in general and then people who had been um, marginalized and, you know, cut out of resources. To support. There, was a, there was also a lot of uh, interest in uh, one particular ward race uh, where uh, a young black guy, Che Ryanfest Smith, Ryanfest is a very popular hip hop Right. Very popular, but somewhat popular hip hop. <laughs> he wrote Jesus Walls, right? He won a Grammy uh, with Con Kanye, uh, and he decided to run for office. And many, many people in the black community are looking to the hip hop community for the hip hop generation for a new infusion of energy and and ideas in, in, in our politics. And so his his, his race was, was watched pretty closely, um, even even in the mainstream. Uh, Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, but he he failed to to, to although he, he did marginally better than many of the other candidates. Uh, he, he still he lost his runoff. He had a runoff and lost ultimately. But he failed to um, generate the kind of electricity and excitement that many hoped he would be able to do. And, and so, uh, although he's not finished, he has other plans for political office. And there is still some hope that the hip hop community will be will do that energizing effort that many people are hoping for and waiting for. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't look promising.
Microphone, please. I spent more time in Chicago than anywhere else in my life. I've noticed from the last three years moving to where I am now, which is uh, so there's one big difference to me about uh, the role of the progressive leadership in organized labor. Uh, for instance, uh, where we are now, the uh, United Steelworkers, uh, and particularly uh, the program that it's running of trying to build alliances with. Blue Green Alliance and Alliance with the African American thing, all the different alliances was trying to build up, is a definitely shaped the politics of where I am now in a very different way. And also in terms of their media, um, their very sophisticated media approach, uh, and I still work as a website, has a whole blog section, free speech section, um, and they're trying and to become a, a one of the core leaders in reshaping the politics of the area. So my question is, um, I know Chicago has a labor movement, but I, from my all my years there, I've never seen something quite as uh, significant as what the steelworkers are doing in our part of the world. Uh, but at the same time, I know that it's possible. Uh, but uh, so my question is, well, what kinds of things are happening? among the more progressive uh, sectors of the, the labor movement. And I'm, I'm quite aware of uh, 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 Salim's point, too, about the hostility on certain sectors. We have, uh, where I live, we have a whole generation, a whole group of young uh, African Americans who have never held a job of any kind. And they're only related, and the construction unions have absolutely nothing to do with them except hostility. Uh, that's uh, that's one wing of the trade union. On the other hand, uh, among the steel workers, it's a you know, it's very um, it's a very integrated reality. In uh, so uh, so my question is, what role is uh, labor and the labor media uh, playing in Chicago? Um, I mean, there definitely is a, I think, a, a vibrant labor media, although I don't think people outside those individual unions or, you know, some other unions necessarily read or ever see that media. And I feel like the Chicago media, both mainstream and obviously um, alternative, is very sympathetic to labor, and you do get some really great labor stories. Um, but then that's where, you know, Steve Franklin at the Tribune, who formerly at the Tribune is no longer there, and I mean, like, everywhere both the cutting of actual labor reporters and just cutting of newspaper, you know, mainstream um, media staff in general has really hurt labor coverage. And I think Chicago unions do do a, a pretty good job of, um, you know, getting their stories out there and selling their stories. And um, like anything, you know, I, I think the more, uh, the better they sort of package their stories, the, the more they do get covered in mainstream media. Um, I think they do a decent job of that. I think it's just, you know, in the Republic Windows and Doors occupation uh, two and a half years ago got international media and, and tons of Chicago media. Um, yeah, Walmart, right? Although Walmart, it seems like the coverage of Walmart has been a, a little confusing, and especially since there's, Walmarts have been, you know, allowed into Chicago. I think um, the coverage has, at least in, in again, in mainstream has, um, not done a really good job of explaining what actually went on with the Walmart situation and, you know, following what that has meant for communities and for labor. Um, you know, one of those things where it's big news, like when a, a big box ordinance is introduced or defeated, but then, you know, in the, the ensuing years, um, like any story, you know, there's not enough follow-up coverage. Um, but I think, uh, I, I would love to see the labor media somehow, and I mean, especially since there's so many new partnerships that, you know, would have been um, not allowed or, or not undertaken in past years, you know, partnerships between mainstream and alternative media. I would love to see labor media somehow make some, uh, some partnerships that would get the stories out there to a wider public. Uh, just, just one small note. 
the, that Walmart um, confrontation, the, the big box ordinance, and that had, uh, created some, some additional conflict between people in the community and the unions because there are, uh, in, in many of Chicago's south side and west side wars, unemployment is atro atrocious. It's a major problem. And so they were welcoming Walmart. Any, any commercial activity other than the underground economy would be welcome in these communities. And yet the unions were fighting against Walmart building. And so there was a lot of anger at the unions for trying to prevent employment opportunities in the community. And so that has increased the, the, uh, the um, opposition to, to unions in the many communities. But it, also in Chicago, there are certain unions that frankly are in bed with uh, the less savory elements of our city, including the police and the firefighters union. I mean, there is no big surprise that they endorsed Jerry Chico uh, because you know, he was going to continue agreements with them that are extremely politically and economically, pro you know, uh, you know, problematic at this point. But, and, and including Pay Burge's defense. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, you know, this, the, the, we know when we talk labor in Chicago, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's not. I mean, it, it's, it's not just the steel workers or whatever. We have these other municipal unions which are. Um, you know, not always looking out for the best interest of the community. Um, and we have situations which have been completely underreported. Um, for example, the teachers union in Chicago was decimated during the presidency of the school board of my favorite guy, Jerry Chico. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that that happened systematically, we, you know, Chicago had just passed school reform, uh, local school councils were in place. Communities were actually beginning to engage in, you know, a very, uh, you know, desperately needed dialogue between the community and the schools. The teachers were engaged in this in in this uh, particular, you know, conversation. You know, this guy comes along as president of the school of the school board, decimates the unions. At, at precisely the moment when all of the mainstream newspapers have pulled back on education coverage, nobody covers it. Nobody understands it. The local school councils actually lose their power. The teachers union is actually taken over by a bunch of assholes who have no interest in the teachers. And we're still in that, and we're still recovering or you know, making some sort of headway they're trying to make some sort of headway in, in, in the, those areas. But I mean, you know, there has been so much politicizing and sort of, des you know, you know, breaking down from within, you know, of the particular, of that particular union, the teachers union, which is essential. You know, that now our schools are, you know, complete disaster. Teachers are, you know, constantly being demonized. And the media is part of that demonization in part because they didn't cover what happened before. And somehow the teachers union has not been able to translate that into, into stories. We have one periodical in Chicago which covers education, uh, The Catalyst, and it has taken a very, you know, sort of uh, placid point of view on, on what's happening in education. They, they are covering the reform of the schools and no, and everyone sort of goes to them as the experts on, on education. I and mean, I know when I was at the Tribune, certainly when somebody would come up with something, it would be, well, check out what the Catalyst has to say. You know? But then again, you know, Chicago media does, you know, even at its, at its height of, of uh, you know, resources in the last 15, 20 years, has not always distinguished itself. I mean, uh, you know, I, I remember we, we did a story at the Tribune that I was involved in, um, involving uh, Angels in America, the, not Angels in America, sorry, uh, Rent, the, the theater, the, the play Rent, where there was an, a lawsuit against uh, Larson by someone who claimed he'd ripped her off. And uh, we actually had first dibs on that story for a lot of bizarre or personal reasons. And the editors at the Tribune actually said, well, how true can it be if New York media hasn't covered it yet? And I'm like, uh, I'm sorry, but this would be a scoop. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps, perhaps you've heard the word. Um, so you know, it's a, it, it, you know, it's it, it, it's it's a lot of circumstances here. A lot of a lot of stuff. 
Also, just real quick on the labor front, the non-union, the workers' centers, which you know have been growing all over the country, and especially in Chicago, have done a really, I think, a really good job, especially working with interfaith groups to get a lot of media coverage to the intersection of labor and immigration issues and different things. I'd also like to mention that in these times, uh, working in these times, it's our labor blog, and uh, Carrie's been writing for this regularly, and we have very, uh, I think, some of the best labor coverage in the country, and uh, a lot on what's going on in Chicago. Carrie is the best labor reporter. <laughs> right. The best stories on labor have been produced by, by this person. one. Right? <laughs> she's, she's the bomb. Uh, my name is Shannon Walker. Um, I'm 21. I'm a sophomore in college. Um, I just broke into the whole journalism um, area about a year ago. Um, I'm a Chicago native, and this is actually more common if you guys care to just comment on this. Just what I've seen, like I write for North Carolina News, and I wrote, I started writing for them over the summer as an intern. And the stories that I've seen, like there are a lot of good things that is actually happening, especially like the, the stories that we did. Uh, specifically pertaining to, uh, towards the North Lando area. And I've seen in incredible statistics, you know, high school dropout rates and so forth and so forth. The reason why, I guess, the people, they just kind of, it seems to me that they just don't care. Like, I mean, pretty much what you all pretty much stated. They don't care because it's a sense of looking, whether you're looking at the glass half empty or half full, and when you, you're always picking up the newspaper and taking a look at, you know, who's dying or who's, you know, just the negative stuff. It's, it gets old pretty quickly. But then you have these organizations like North Line News, these nonprofit organizations who actually do try to reach out there, you know, to communities, uh, especially pertaining to minorities, and try to, you know, throw stories out there, try to let them know exactly what's going on. But then they're fighting to keep their doors open. You know, North Line News especially, they're, you know, they don't have that much, that, you know, the kind of funds to keep their doors open consistently. They're always fighting and fighting. It's been a battlefield when I worked there. You know, trying to keep it going. So, if you guys just care to comment on, you know, the the organizations, the the publications that actually do exist, that's trying to get out there, but it's almost as if they just can't. They're taking a step forward, but then two steps back. Well, you know, there are there are um, newspapers like Chicago Crusader, Chicago Standard. Um, many of these newspapers are. They attempt to provide positive news um, as well as the kind of, of um, body count uh, journalism that we, we find often. Uh, but as you point out, lack of resources makes that very difficult. And people, although they clamor for positive news, they don't they don't really patronize uh, publications that 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 traffic in positive. And in fact, I think Laura Washington was involved with a major attempt by a new a, a network. To, to provide news that had context and, and was not focused on body count journalism. And it, did, it didn't work out. So yes, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying and the lack of resources is one of the problems. One of the things that we wanna do here is kind of connect a lot of these, um, um, with, with this project is connect a lot of these uh, uh, local publications and, and in some sort of way to give them uh, um, a more cooperative profile so that they can Perhaps you can raise money in, in, a, in, a more, um, in a more effective way uh, because they are absolutely necessary and people still look to them for, for the kind of personal and local news that is lacking in other publications, but, but they have a, a real problem with generating resources. Um, I, you know, I think one of the things that's, uh, that's happened is that the very nature of the local newspaper has changed. Uh, you know, before you had local businesses that would support the local newspapers, and now you don't have local businesses, so it's very difficult to to do that. We we do have a local newspaper in my neighborhood that's very good, and that's the Lakefront Outlook. Um, but it, the reason it works out is because it's a sister paper to the High Park Herald, and it's basically supported by businesses from from uh, uh, from High Park. Um, I. I, I actually think WBEZ has been doing better and better coverage. We have a fantastic reporter and Natalie Moore, um, and she kicks ass every day. You know, she gets up every morning and kicks somebody's ass. Um, 
Um, and the attempt to, to have Vocalo, which is this series of blogs, has a lot of possibilities. The problem with it is that the, we are all paid extremely low. Like, what I am paid to blog, uh, you know, it paid for the hotel here. You know, the entire month's worth of pay is paying for the hotel, basically. Um, and, uh, and we have no direction. We, we write about what we want to write about. So if I choose to spend two weeks putting together a story on Jerry Chico, that's my choice, and they'll publish it, and they're proud of it, and they'll promote it to death. Um, I don't know that I necessarily want direction, but the point is that if I also choose to you know, write about poetry for the next month, uh, no one's going to care. And that's true across the board. So what, what happens is that the coverage is extremely uneven because it's extremely personal. I think there are good things, to, good aspects to that. But also, you know, somebody's having a bad day, they're not going to kill themselves to write a news story. They're going to go for the poetry. Certainly I will. Um, so, um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a touch and go situation. Um, but I, I, in the Latino community, I think outside of WRTE, there's not much that's worth Going. But they do have blogs on their website, and they do sort of have a lot of that material that goes on the air. So if you're not in their uh, coverage area, you can still pick up on, on what's going on with them. No one is doing any significant original reporting uh, that I can find in the Latino community. Nobody. Except for the, t the, the TV stations that I mentioned. But at the print, the print level, no one. So just let me quick because I know we have some other questions, but I, Windy City, Windy, Windy City Windy Times, City Times Windy City Times, they're about to actually about to launch a, a major uh, year-long reporting initiative around the 30th anniversary of the, of the AIDS crisis. So and they do, they do incredible work, community-based community-based work, and, 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 and Indigo is another good newspaper that's that's, 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 that's aimed at a specific audience, the African American middle middle class. It's, it's struggling, but like all uh, niche publications are struggling right now. Just two quick things. One is. I don't want you to cry any tears for the legacy media, but you know the Chicago Tribune is in bankruptcy right now and has been for a long time and will, and it will be probably for the re most of the rest of this, this year and is decimated in terms of the amount of coverage as we've heard. They're not doing labor reporting anymore. They're not doing as much arts and culture reporting anymore. All their bureaus. And the Sun Times, just my paper just came out of bankruptcy uh, uh, about a year and a half ago and they're hanging by a thread. So this is not just... Uh, again, don't cry any tears for the biddies, but this is a this is an economic and financial crisis across the, the media. I I actually have a lot of hope for, and I, I think it's short-term hope. But I have a lot of hope for projects like the Community News Matters project that we're all involved in, in one way or another, um, because there's a a lot of excitement in the foundation community now. Foundations are supporting this project, and and it, and it was spurred by the Knight Foundation, which has done a major initiative across the country for several years from now around community-based journalism. While that's hot, while the foundations think it's hot, let's take advantage of it and, and plant some seeds, and I'm hoping that's what we can do. And so if you, I, I think that North London News might have applied for something um, in that project, and, and if you didn't get something this round, I would really encourage you and anybody who's doing any community-based news uh, to, to look at some of these foundations as sources of funds, because there's a lot of exciting, exciting things going on there. Thank you. Uh, it's clear that both uh, the Republican and the Democratic Party are uh, converged and are not going to uh, provide us any uh, progressive alternative uh, or, or not enough to, to uh, save us from the cliff we're facing. And uh, the media refuse to cover um, third party candidates. They sort of run it, as you said, like horse races and try to predict and be on the side of the winner. And uh, third party candidates can't raise big corporate money and sort of there's a vicious cycle that, uh, that keeps us trapped in the Republicrats and vastly disproportionately uh, low income people and communities of color are, are the victims of that. And I wonder if you could um, give us thoughts on how we could reach the, those people that have turned away from the system and don't vote, and that's why they don't vote. It's not apathy, it's helplessness. There's really not a choice. And we see that, and here we have a, a, a black uh, governor in Massachusetts that has not um, fulfilled his ideological promise. The president has not fulfilled his ideological promise. 
how do we get how do we get the message to the people who need it who are not going to be told this by the major newspapers that they have to turn somewhere else well specifically about covering uh, third party candidates I would love to I really would I'd love it if somebody would return my phone call that I'm honest to God uh, I have struggled with uh, with covering third party candidates we had a third party Senate candidate in Illinois I can't even tell you how many times I called that dude um, I went to his website I wrote I did everything and nothing happened um, I ended up covering Patricia Watkins, uh, the third party candidate that was called a crackhead, um, because, uh, you know, after much persistence, uh, somebody finally got back to me. You know, it was crazy. My readers were leaving me messages on my blog saying, we should be covering the third party candidates, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like trying desperately to respond, um, and uh, it didn't happen. And I have it, in all of my political coverage, I have always found that the media part of third party candidacies is very weak. And I understand that there are very few resources. I get that. You know, and, and I will actually chase, you know, uh, those candidates more than I will major candidates. My attitude with Rom was, you know, I called him twice. He knows who I am. We double dated. Uh, you know, it's a. Uh, uh, you know, I was not going to go chase him, you know, fuck him, if he doesn't want to get back to me, that's fine, he's overcovered anyway, but I mean, I will, I will call and call, I will chase people down, I will go to the event that, uh, that is supposed to be happening at 2 o'clock and doesn't actually get off the ground until 4, um, you know, and, but I, I really think the fact that media is never a priority in these, in these candidacies has a lot to do with it. I think the fact that the, the platform is in somebody's head instead of written down is really problematic. I mean, my experience, and I've, and I've been covering politics for a long time in Chicago, and the, it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare sometimes to try to get this information. In Massachusetts, they were not even letting the Green Party candidate uh, uh, part they were excluding the Green Party candidate in the gubernatorial race here from debates. And they set a criterion of how much money she had raised. It's the opposite of the criterion you should be, you should be using. She hadn't gotten enough money. She hadn't been bought off sufficiently to enter the debates. In Illinois, was a certain poll number that they had to have in order to. Right, they, 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 yeah, that was true. I think even at the public television station, uh, the PBS station in, in Chicago, uh, required that you have a certain poll, uh, certain, be, be a certain level in the poll poll, and in some cases other news organizations talked about raising certain money, but I think that reinforces Aji's point that you have to then figure out a way around those obstacles and you have to be creative, and I haven't had, haven't had exactly the same experience Aji's had about reaching out to Green Party candidates, but I haven't seen a Green Party or other third party candidates, I'm thinking of the Green Party because that is the most dominant third party candidate right now in Illinois, I haven't seen uh, any particular sophistication or thoughtfulness behind the way they approach uh, the media other than to talk about things like being kept out of debates, which is a legitimate argument, but there's other, many other ways and many other arguments that, that they could be putting forward that I'm not hearing. Hi, I have two quick remarks and a question uh, for the panel. Uh, remark number one, uh, on the Polakos remark. The word in the Polish language for someone who is from Poland happens to be Polak, spelled P-O-L-A-K. So the Spanish derivation probably is originally derived from Polish. And the fact that it happens to be, is a different spelling, a slur in English, is, is I think a cause of ignorance. Mark one oh, no. I mean, But yeah, 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 I, I hear your point. It was like, you know, high tide at some time. Right, right, right. There. Probably Re not so now that Laura's there. Remark number two, more a plug. I'm part of a group that works on media issues, and I know everyone, uh, or nearly everyone on the panel on this front, for folks here in the room should know, Chicago Media Action, online at chicagomediaaction.org. I have um, buttons and flyers on behalf of the group. See me after class if you're interested. Um, and plug. Uh, question for the panel. Um, this has to do kind of with a question I've been trying to wrestle with with a kind of chicken and egg problem related to media and the influx of money in politics. Yes, uh, as Chicago in the media featured, Voldemort elected mayor of Chicago. It was the headline uh, on the day of the mayoral election. 
uh, the reference to the antagonist of the Harry Potter series of books and films. <laughs> um, Mayor Voldemort raised more than five to one the amount of money of his entire opposition, five candidates combined. So that's obviously a humongous factor, upwards of $18 million, as Lauren has said. That said, though, the Chicago Reporter had done an interesting analysis that appeared on the Chicago Now series of blogs, where they counted the number of times each of the respective six candidates were quoted or mentioned by name in the sometimes in the Tribune. And they found that the number of times and the relative percentages of those mentions mapped to a frightening extent the actual amount of the turnout in the votes. So this is a question here. I focus mostly on media issues, and I've been increasing, increasingly focusing some more attention and interest on the political economy aspect. But in some senses, I guess they're both pretty important, and in some weird ways, they feed on each other. And so I guess my question, kind of touching on what Kari had mentioned, do we have to work on both? Is there one we should focus on? What are your thoughts on this thorny issue? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's, uh, in terms of, you know, the candidates buying prominence, I mean, they're, I guess it's so tied, it's also tied together, I, I guess what would be good is just to see more stories directly attack, you know, not attacking, but directly exploring um, the funding issue. I mean, I know those are out there, but, the, you know, the numbers that the, the candidates have raised, there's plenty of coverage of those actual numbers, but looking, you know, more incisively at what that actually means and, you know, and more at, at who their donors are and, you know, in past, I mean, the, um, one of the issues that got a lot of coverage in Chicago was the coal burning plant in um, these two low income, there's two plants in these two low income, mostly Latino communities. And um, it's sort of thrown out there a lot that a lot of uh, the, the local aldermen and other politicians have gotten a lot of donations from that company. but. There hasn't been real deep analysis. I mean, the, and the numbers, actually, I've looked at the numbers, you know, the donations, and, and they're not even really that high. Um, so there's obviously more going on there. So I think it would be good to, for media, if possible, to look at how influence plays out in other ways and, you know, really just how these things work behind the scenes. It's a, it's a tricky assignment, but I'd love to see that. Uh, the Chicago Reporter, again, uh, did a... Uh, uh, study uh, some years ago about money and politics where they it found that there was a direct correlation, correlation between the amount of money uh, uh, a candidate could raise in his, in his or her race. So African American and Latino uh, districts and wards in the city, uh, their candidates raise far less uh, money than, than their white counterparts. It's, it's pretty intuitive when you think about why, because of some of the things we've been talking about here today, because uh, African American and Latino communities are, tend to be the most devastated economic communities in this in the in the city and in the country there's there's no businesses there's no jobs there's no there's not a lot of business support um, so therefore that that's that's where the campaign money comes from there's a reason but I think maybe it's, it's time taking a look at that study I think the Center for Responsive Politics has done some research on this too and, and that's the reason why Barack Obama is uh, talking about raising up what we still one billion dollars to get reelected as president of the United States because that's what it takes you really are in an environment where you really have to buy media coverage by, by, by raising campaign cash. It's, it's interesting, the campaign cash gives you a cachet and, and, and raises your stature in the media's mind. Your, 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 your eligibility to be elected raises, uh, it, the stature gets raised the, the more money you raise. You, you become a serious candidate. Yes. There's a temp, and, and that's one of the reasons why people were looking so intently at the 20th Ward, because the, the kind of a cultural um, uh, bypass uh, of, of that money's problem. The Ryan Fest. Fest thing. Um, and the Sixth Ward is an example of that. Frederina <coughs> Lau, for example, was running against Roderick Sawyer, and she was supported by unions um, and, and by, uh, by, by many businesses in her community. She raised more money. And by ROM. And by ROM. Uh, $50,000. Exactly. Um, and, and yet, Roderick won, and one of the ways he won was using. What they the house music community in Chicago house music was very big and Rod comes from that generation and so there were a lot of people who rallied behind him uh, giving house music prop parties and what that so they in, in that way they bypassed that money issue and then so uh, many people are looking toward the cultural realm as a way perhaps to do that. 
But in that race, she also had a huge thing against her, which was that she'd voted for the parking meter deal. Yes. So it made it impossible for her to claim any independence. Yes. The parking meter deal for those who don't. Uh, the, uh, the city basically gave away the parking meter contract for the next 75 years. Uh, 75. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that was happening in that race is that Rod, Roderick is uh, the, son the son of a former mayor who, uh, you know, was sort of vilified in his time, but who over over time has become well, more. I won't stop me. No, no, I, he, I, I love the guy, but uh, the, you know, in, in some. In some places he was vilified, in some places he was much loved, but he was certainly misunderstood and he sort of, there's been a new appreciation of him in a lot of different ways. So there's a lot of stuff going on in that war that was, that was very peculiar. But I, I think one of the, the questions that's also never really asked when we talk about uh, campaign economies and reform and all this stuff is that we have a tendency, for example, to really look at where Rom's money is coming from, how Rom is using the money. There's so much of it, it's overwhelming, it's really shiny. We want to kind of catch him on something. And nobody really talks, for example, about you know where Gary Chico's money was coming from. I mean, I did a story in which I basically laid out where his money was coming from. People were stunned. I mean, the Chicago Magazine did a story later and referred to mine and said, Achi Obama's prescient article. And it was not even vaguely prescient. <laughs> There was nothing prescient about it. It was in the it was in it was in the record. Um, you know, we don't look at how Carol Mosley Braun used her money. I'd be really curious to do a breakdown on that because I can promise you it was badly used. You know, uh, I almost guarantee you it was badly used. Um, went to a lot of consultants. Went to a lot of consultants. Yeah, no, a lot of who didn't do a great job. Who didn't do a great job? And I should say they were evil consultants from the beginning. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, so there's a tendency to sort of think that the, the, the money is just somehow either not impressive enough or being used okay at this level, uh, and somehow at that level it's just all, you know, this terrible darkness. Well, but it's not. I mean, there's, there, there are reasons why, you know, some of these campaigns don't work. That is not just because the other guy raised a lot more money. You know, sometimes the campaigns don't work because things were done badly and because there are other interests that are at play and you know we don't we don't talk about that we don't examine those very well and i think we need to do that um, my name is Roger Rojas i'm an undergraduate student in, in Los Angeles and uh, i am a McNair scholar who had the opportunity to study uh, the primary and general elections and present research in, in Berkeley and Stanford. Um, and uh, for the longest time I had been trying to find a term that described kind of the hunch that I felt with, with how media was covering the elections and that was horse race, horse race uh, coverage. And um, the way that I had felt about it before was that it was sort of like the coverage that you see or hear at a boxing match. So Barack Obama needs to make sure that he has his, uh, his distance and make sure that he concentrates with the jab while McCain is going to make sure that he comes in close in for an uppercut. Barack Obama needs to sway away from this. And, and, and what I felt about this, and <laughs> what, what, the way I felt about it was that it really did, did do a disservice to, the, to voters because it put them in a passive state of mind as merely spectators instead of putting them in a position of power, empowering a community and putting them in a, a, a position to actually participate in something that really should be participatory because that's what our democracy is about. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to know how, how you felt about that. And well, one more question or statement was that perhaps, you know, with some of the things that media could do, perhaps we could actually, instead of, um, making the correct statements to get people to think but asking the right questions because then that puts the viewers, listeners, readers in a position to actually go out and try to answer those questions themselves. And that's a, an empowering uh, 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 form of, of, of media and democracy, again, as, as we say. Or, you know, we could consider that uh, the, the uh, Socratic method, right? asking the right questions. And there's a lot of statements that can be made through, through questions as well. So I wanted to get your feel and see how, how, how you felt about that. You should be a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> With your future. Go ahead. 
I think that's, that that's really a, a, a fascinating insight that, you know, that we, the psychology of the way the media covers and presents the political stories uh, influences how they are received. I mean, you're basically saying this horse race sort of sports metaphor creates a specta spectator mindset. I think that's fascinating and right on. And uh, our time's up. I'd like to thank our panel and uh, all of you for coming and, uh, and uh, enjoy the conference.